What do you do when everything happens all at once? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me today, the best of the best. We have Real Vision co-founder Ralph Powell, Andreas Deno Larson, senior editor at Real Vision and author of Send of Signals, and David Matten, editor of the New World Same Humans newsletter. Hi, and welcome to all of you. Great to see you. Happy Friday. I mean, yeah, I, I, good thing it came just in time, right? Listen, before we even begin, um, we put that question at the top because it really does feel like everything is happening all at once to steal the the line from the Academy Award winning movie. And it, it feels like it's a really important moment as well. There are so many critical things happening. Some of them are interconnected. Some of them are running parallel. So we are extended Friday. We're going to be here for the whole hour sorting through this, taking your questions live. We want you all to be able to participate. If you are not a Real Vision member, you can click the QR code or the link and get a free trial so that you can stay with us the entire time. This is really, really important stuff. So Rao, let's kick off with you. We've spent the last two weeks talking about the big macro challenges facing us um, and why the future is, seems really perilous and then maybe what the opportunities are and how we can sort of find a way through. And in the middle of that, a banking crisis blew up. I mean, what are your thoughts as yeah. a, about where we that, are right now? And uh, GPT-4. So yeah. we like humanity is about to be replaced at the same time as we're having a financial crisis. These look. The reason we set up Real Vision was exactly for this, right? We are in a world that is complex and kind of fucked from demographics, debt, geopolitics. All of these things together are making everybody scared, confused. We didn't imagine when we started this, when we highlighted this, when I kicked it all off two weeks ago, that one of these shoes was going to drop. In fact, two of these shoes were going to drop. The other one was technology. Mm. And in the course of this two weeks, the banking crisis happened and this technology nuclear bomb has just happened. But Real Vision was set up exactly for this, to navigate this. We came out of the financial crisis and the European debt crisis and the banking crisis, and I knew I had to do something about it by helping people. This is our chance to help people. So listen, anybody watching this, I know you've got lots of questions. You're probably nervous about your investments. You're probably nervous about your future. You don't really understand what's going on. That's what we're here for. It's not my voice. It's all of these experts. We all have different opinions. We're all trying to add weight and understanding to what is going on. So just click on that free trial. Honestly, it's the best zero dollars you'll ever spend because what you get is priceless knowledge and really it's going to help. And there's a shit ton of information already there from the last two weeks, but it'll be ongoing because we're in the middle of something really important. We need to help people navigate it. So yeah. that's. Yeah. And so, so, so let's, we're going to take, and we're going to do the best. There are such big things to pull in. We're going to do our best to weave it in throughout the show with your questions, but I want to start a little bit near term and then, and then talk about some of this stuff. So Raul, banking crisis, let's start there because we've got a lot of questions. I want to hit you and Andreas up yeah. on this. So How gonna, are you feeling about where I'm things are? I'm going to distill it into very simple forms. The rates are too damn high. The yield curve is inverted. Banks can't make money. So they're falsely making a yield curve by having deposits at half a percent as opposed to paying four or five percent. So they're falsely making a yield curve to try and make profits. Problem is, every depositor just goes and gives it to the Fed directly in Treasury Direct or a money market fund. So you've got a deposit flight. And on the other side, the asset side of the equation, when those deposits leave, they need to collapse the other side of the trade, which is the lending that they've done in the government bond market, and they've lost money. So it's a disaster. So what the Fed are doing are like, oh, well, let's get everybody together and just paper over the cracks of the deposit or the other side of the equation. Neither of these things work. The reason this whole problem is here is because the yield curve's inverted and the rates are too damn high. They need to bring interest rates down two or 300 basis points as fast as possible to stop the bleeding. However, these small banks are going to have a big problem with commercial real estate which they're never going to get off their books. Some of this stuff is going to end up getting bulldozed. And they've got other issues within their balance sheets as well. So it's very reminiscent of the 1990 kind of savings and loan crisis 
it's, I don't think it's the financial crisis, and I'll come on in a sec why. So the banks are going to be under pressure. The only answer is lower rates and more cowbell, which is quantitative easing, which has already started in one way, shape or form. You know, people say it's not quantitative easing. You'll always get somebody, an actually guy on Twitter to say, well, it's not this, it's not that. Basically, the Fed balance sheet's going up. That's all we need to know, right? Is money supply increasing? That's the other thing we need to know. So the Fed will probably do 25 basis points at this meeting. It'll be the end of the, of the hiking cycle. My guess is the next move from the Federal Reserve within two months will be a 100 basis point emergency cut. So I think um, yields are going to plummet from here. They have to. And I've written a lot about this in Global Macro Investor and Pro Macro about the problems of, um, of the interest payments in the economy. It's too long to talk about here. So that's what I think is coming. They have to steepen the yield curve as fast as possible. So I think they cut rates two or 300 basis points uh, in pretty short order. So I'm talking into late summer, September or so. We will go into recession. We've, Andreas and I have been flagging this forever. It was you know, in our forward looking indicators for a long time. We go into recession. My guess is we come out the other side, i.e. we hit bottom maybe this quarter or next quarter. Um, and then we come up the other side. But the other side's going to be slow. Trend rate of GDP is slow, and it's going to be ugly and messy. But right here and right now, this banking crisis is not going to go away. And certainly by lending a bunch of big banks money and put, then putting it onto other people's balance sheets, none of this shit's going to work. It just smells. The whole thing smells. And it's going to have to unravel in the age-old way, which is everyone's going to start panicking about the insolvencies in these firms, whether it's deposit flights or their, their books. And in the end, the Fed has to come with a cowbell. And and talking about 100 basis points of emergency cut in the near term is, is I, I don't think anyone has said that yet. I know the market's pricing in cuts by the end of the year, but that's a really, that I think that gives an indication of just how concerned you are about the situation. Because if it If it's right, I've done a ton of banking crises in my life. The outcome is always the same 100% of the time emergency rate cuts as fast as you can. Now, we're not there yet, but once we get the next leg lower in these in these banks, they didn't close well today, mm. and the bond market, bond yields, you know, thir- uh, 10 years closed on its lows. Once we see the next leg of that, which is why I've got the buy bonds, wear diamonds t-shirt, because the only thing you do in a situation like this is buy bonds. Um, once it makes the next leg lower, that's going to set the alarms off. Um, we've got to get through the Fed meeting. Um, I also, which is very controversial, I'm very bullish equities because more cowbell. If you debase the currency, um, equities go up. So I'm very bullish crypto, very bullish bonds, very bullish technology stocks in particular. Interesting. Andreas, I want to get your thoughts. And one of the one of the things I love about the series that we just did, and hopefully we can dig into some of it a little bit, is that we had a lot of disagreement and a lot of people who had very different views. It makes it confusing for people. But when you listen to some of their, you know, what they think. So, Andreas, I don't know. Where do you come down on this? I, I, I don't think you think it's quantitative easing, do you? No, I do not. But it can end up as quantitative easing. Um, let's suppose that some of these banks lending money at the Fed now go bankrupt, then this will turn into QE automatically. And that is probably the end game here anyway. So whether we call it QE or not, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. And if you look at the move in the two-year bond yield just this week, then um, try and compare it to the move in the two-year bond yield after Lehman or after 9-11. The moves that we saw after 9-11 and the Lehman, they look like um, a drop in the, in the ocean compared to what we've seen over the past week here. So the bond market is screaming and you should never bet against the bond market screaming this loud. I need to emphasize that. So I agree on the direction of travel with Raul here. Yeah. So uh, people took great pains make, this week, but make, you're both sounding very, you know, saying it's a drop in the bucket compared to Lehman, 100 basis point emergency rate cut. It sounded like everyone took great pains all week long to say this is not the great financial crisis. This is not a wait. This can be contained. This is an isolated situation. Doesn't sound like either of you think that. No, but I also don't think it's the financial crisis. Okay, that's because important. we have the magic bullet, which is quantitative easing. So in a financial crisis, if your collateral is going down, you go bust. But what QE does is make your collateral go up optically in price. And so it stops 
the bankruptcies. Doesn't mean you repair the P&Ls or anything else, but if your collateral doesn't fall, you're okay. So I don't think it can ever get as bad as 2008 using this particular mechanism. There's an outside chance for sure. I don't think so. I don't know. Andreas, what do you think? Well, uh, you're touching upon an important point here because what the Fed did last Sunday was essentially to backstop the U.S. Treasury market with this new lending program. They've been telling banks since 2008 um, that the U.S. Treasury market is the safest in the world and therefore they need to back it up. Uh, they've been telling banks to hold treasuries in their uh, high quality liquid asset portfolios. Uh, it's, it's simply regulation. They need to hold these assets and therefore the Fed needed to step in to ensure that uh, the treasury market functioned. Uh, so in that sense, it kind of resembles what happened in the UK uh, during the autumn last year that um, the central bank simply had to step in to backstop the core functioning uh, of the yield curve and the core functioning of the treasury market locally. Uh, and therefore, I, uh, I perfectly agree with you, Raul, that uh, since the Fed has now backstopped the US treasury market, it will not turn into a collateral crisis. What it will turn into is a major move of deposits from small and medium sized banks to a very few large banks. So we will end up with a US banking system that will look a lot like the European banking system after this crisis is over. Uh, and I can guarantee you by watching the price action in European banks and after having worked for one of the biggest Northern European banks that it is not a bullish scenario for US <laughs> large caps. <laughs> no. So what does this do to, uh, Raul, you touched on this before, what does this do to economic growth? So economic growth, we're going into recession. Um, I think it's more like 1990 recession, which was pretty nasty. It didn't, I mean, the stock market fell 20% that time. Bond yields collapsed. The banking system was creaking at the seams. Commercial real estate took four years to recover. Jobs took a long time to recover. Um, I think that's what we're doing. But I think it's, again, a lot of people are looking at 2008 or 2000 saying it's going to be something like this. I don't think it is. I think it's a, it's a traditional, recession with credit contraction that creates an overhang in some parts of the economy. So I think we go down fast, take a long time to recover um, because commercial real estate is stuck on all of these small banks books. And I was sitting down with uh, the commercial real estate portfolio manager, of one of the biggest pension funds in the United States three days ago. And he's like, some of this stuff is never going to get used and never going to be sold. They're going to literally have to bulldozer it down. He said it's already seeing it in many cities in the US, mm. is that people just aren't going back to work. Look at Real Vision. Maggie, when's the last time you went to the office in New York? We're stuck in a lease. We reduced it from 65 people to a 35-person lease, and still two or three people go to the office. He, even here in Cayman, it's only a five-minute journey for us. There's two people in the office. Mm. Nope, it's finished. They're stuck. Uh, and that loss, those losses are going to have to get eaten by the pension system because they own it. Which is, which is why I know a lot of people were worried about the pension system as being a place where things break and they were looking that way. Andreas, we've talked about it with people and yet it came from banking. I mean, that was the place where we saw it turn up. Yeah, but it, it came from pensions, the pension system in the UK during the autumn. Yes. Uh, so it's the kind of the same issue. Uh, it all depends on where you uh, eventually uh, lie the risk and um, in in the UK uh, system it was the pension fund system that broke first in the US the banking system broke first but there will be ramifications for the pension that's system that's my well. point is that where it's going to you know everyone talking about containing it we haven't even looked under the hood of what's happening in those important areas right yeah no, no not at all and and especially if if Raul is right that commercial real estate uh, will drop like um i don't know what um over the coming quarters uh, which i find uh, to be a very likely scenario then we will see the spillovers to the pension system there is absolutely and, no doubt and the lending's been done by the small banks so they're the main lenders of commercial real estate so this is that linkage the only other one that i haven't understood andreas i don't know your view on this is I'm really surprised insurance companies haven't blown up here because somebody's got the bond market very wrong. Um, and my guess is the insurance companies somewhere down the track have got something wrong here. 
Yeah, but uh, that's a really good question that I don't have the answer to why we haven't seen a uh, a blow up of an insurance company yet, but uh, they obviously sit on large risks as well uh, in this kind of scenario. So um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we'll put that one to Mike Kuba because he knows he knows a thing or two about the um, you know the what what happens on the on the balance sheets of insurance companies. So in, so somebody's got the bond market very wrong. Somebody's also got the energy market very wrong. Right, Andreas? I mean, we've seen oil dropping significantly this week. That was a, a lot of people were anticipating that structurally higher inflation scenario. We had people talking about it throughout our series this week, still thinking that that was the case. Do you see any threat of inflation or higher energy prices against the backdrop that you described? Andreas, I'm going to start with you. No, uh, that's the short answer. Uh, I've looked into every single curve steepening of the dollar yield curve, which is what is ongoing now. Uh, the Fed will have to cut interest rates and they will have to re-steepen the yield curve uh, to help the banking sector. And uh, if we look into the last seven uh, re-steepenings of the dollar yield curve, commodities have dropped every single time. So we are close, as close as we get to a 100% hit ratio in being short commodities here. Wow. Well. Same. I mean, I've been calling for the oil to get to 60 bucks, and I think I might be optimistic. Let's see. Now, we all understand the supply shortages, but demand wins every time. Everyone forgets this. Uh, the great conversation with, um, as ever, Dwight Anderson, who's like the world's best commodity hedge fund manager. And he's like, yeah, you know, I'm bullish on oil on a structural supply story, but you've got to factor in demand. And in a recession, nobody uses oil. You know, we've got stuff like excess inventories everywhere. So that means I, uh, industrial production slows down. Um, and if there's excess inventories, then industrial production in Asia slows down as well. So there's going to be less demand for oil. I mean, all of the commodity prices now en masse are down year on year. They're negative. So that's deflation. Mm -hmm. There is, I mean, I do not see a single evidence, shred of evidence to suggest that inflation is sticky. I think it's a false narrative um, and it's going to get taken out and shot over this next few months. I think this is important because we have we, we really saw this divide between I know Raul, you've been you've been talking about this, Andreas, you've been as well, but there are the people who believe that we're in this structurally you know higher inflation regime, maybe one with dips and not, but that that's the sort of broader longer term picture. Did this banking situation catch people off guard? Do you think that people in that camp will change their mind? Is that scenario, is this banking, the damage done to the economy from the banking sector, is that priced in or is that still have to process and be registered, do you think? I think it's pretty evident from the market moves that we've seen this week that uh, right about everyone, their mother, their dog and their parents were long uh, uh, this story of higher for longer. Um, so all major hedge funds had shorts uh, on in the front end of the dollar curve, uh, meaning that they betted on, on higher interest rates through the summer. Um, and essentially that is why we can see a move of more than 100 basis points uh, in, in the direction of lower yields in the two year bond yield in the US. I mean, it happens very rarely and it only happens because everyone was caught wrong footed. Okay, so we're we're we'll we'll get to some questions on the implications of this because people are asking, obviously. But I want to bring David in because as this is happening, as part of our series, if you have not watched the series, uh, Raul sat down with Imad from Stability AI and talked about uh, the what's happening on the AI front. This blew my mind. We've said this before. Raul has said that the, the first interview that they did was one of the most important that we've ever had on Real Vision. If that is true, this second one was even more so. And David, this week we had, it, I think, kind of for people that are not in the technology space, perhaps went a little unnoticed because of everything going on. Oh, and we haven't mentioned the U.S. and Russian jet almost colliding and President Xi going to visit Russia, all the geopolitical headlines. Chat GPT-4 was released. David, can you talk to us a little bit about what kind of bombshell that is in the tech world? Because believe it or not, um, all those events have not flown or beeped on my radar at all because of the scale of obsession with what unfolded this week um, with Chat GPT-4. I mean, look, I heard the rumors the week before uh, that, that 
GPT-4 was about to, to drop this week. I have to say I was extremely skeptical and I was proven wrong because it did. And, and look, in a live demonstration, we saw someone sketch in his notebook a simple web page, give that sketch to GPT-4, and in 20 seconds, there was a fully functional working web page. So oh philosophically, this is a profound reordering of the relationship between our imagination and reality. That's, that's, that's the best conceptual description I can offer at the moment. We are infinite sort of information processors. We have this incredible recursive power of imagination. We can imagine anything we like. The problem has always been, and we're so accustomed to it, we haven't really modeled it as a problem, but the problem has always been, there's a huge amount of friction. There's a huge amount of human labor and work and technique and know-how between your imagination and what you can put into the world. Now, at least when it comes to the digital space, when it comes to digital artifacts, we're on the eve of simply removing that friction altogether. So you can imagine and then describe an email, a web page, an app, a PowerPoint deck, an entire website, you know, a virtual world, and it will, it will, it will come to be. Uh, and anyone who believes they understand all the implications of that is simply lying, perhaps to themselves. I'll be generous and say they're lying to themselves, but they are simply lying. We, we simply cannot comprehend all the implications of that. But from an economic and productivity standpoint, look, Microsoft two days later said they're about to put GPT-4 in their office suite of, of tools, you know, Word, Excel. That's 1.2 billion people. 1.2 billion people use those tools, hundreds of millions of them. Their working life is profoundly woven through those tools. So we are just about to witness a historically unprecedented live experiment in the transformation of knowledge flows, information flows, and knowledge work. Hundreds of millions of people, their, their working life is about to be completely reordered and we get to watch it. I think it's a, <laughs> I, I like, David, it's I a have profound to say, moment. I, 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 I love when I talk to optimists, but I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a little bit more uh, uh, sort of on the, and I'm not skeptical, I'm concerned. Because when you say that, it's like opening up everyone's imagination. And I think people are like, oh, this is, uh, Raul, I listened to your interview with Emot and I messaged you this morning because I, I suddenly was struck by the fact that almost everything else we're talking about might not matter and is a sideshow. That's what I said to you. And, and when I heard him say, this is bigger than the great financial crisis, this is bigger than the pandemic, the, the disruption that's about to come I'm not sure it's all going to be rosy. We we just don't know. And it seems like absolutely no one is prepared for this. No, it's it literally is the biggest event outside of like world wars that humanity has ever faced. David's trying to explain it because it's so big you can't get your head around it. Like all of those jobs from Silicon Valley that have just been all those people laid off, they're never coming back into work. Right. Accountants, lawyers, doctors, um, almost every single profession is going to lose workforce because this one simple bloody model beats humans at the medical exams, at the accounting exams, at all exams. It is so fast that humanity can't compete with it. So the level of productivity increase for those that remain in the workforce goes exponential. And as Emad and I have been chatting even on Twitter, and again, people can't get their heads around this, exponentials are hard to understand, right? Because it's always ever increasing rate. But the problem is here is we've got Microsoft, Google, Stability AI, soon to be Amazon, all building AI models with thousands of companies building applications on top and up to a billion people will have it in fucking three months, right? <laughs> this is what's called Reed's law. It's very rarely ever seen. It's when it's basically the square root of, of Metcalfe's law. We, I don't know how we're going to deal with this. And it's Literally. happening. It's happening without basically coming from a handful of people 
completely bypassing any kind of conversation societally about how we deal with the fallout. Governments don't even understand it. I mean, I really, really encourage everyone to listen to this interview and share it with anyone you care about is what I posted today because we're really not ready for this. We haven't had any of the conversations and I don't even know how you model for that. I mean, Andreas in Europe, they've always been, I think a little bit more, people don't like that the government's involved, but they've been more aware perhaps of information of, a, of the disruption. I mean, are people talking about AI, the impact it's going to have on jobs, on industries? I, I mean, Maggie, let me say this first. The more I listen to Raoul and David, the more I want to belong healthcare stocks because I, I sincerely think that this will turn into a crisis of mental health if we go down this road to, this fast. I mean, uh, what will uh, what will happen to all of these people in case? Um, so uh, it's, of course, a big thing, but no, it is not as high on the radar in, in Europe as it is in the US. That's uh, for sure my impression. Uh, I'm I'm still one of the very very few talking about it in Northern Europe uh, to the extent that uh, we talk about it on Real Vision and I'm still kind of considered a lunatic every time I try to convey this story to people. Um, yeah. So uh, for sure we are far behind the curve on this story. And this is this is what concerns me, David. When we're talking about, I think people easily go to. Um, oh, it's fear mongering or it's sort of these, you know, hyperbolic somehow that you're we're talking about these big changes, but it's not if it is happening, right? It is released. It's not you can't put it back. No, you you, you no, you're definitely not putting that this one back in in any kind of box. And it's certainly not an if it's it's a it's a now. And in <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of governments. Yeah, I mean, just forget about that. You know, we our, our, and I'm not blaming anyone particularly, but our governments are sort of in the middle right now of a conversation about, you know, Web 2.0 technologies. They're trying to figure out what they should do about Instagram. This is like a 20 years ago <laughs> technology that they're just coming round to kind of figuring out how do we like regulate the idea that um, teenagers can sort of send pictures and videos to one another. And look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm like, it's a very hard problem. I'm not trying to blame them, but dude, like they're, they're nowhere near, they're nowhere near getting a handle on what this is about to do across the next six months to God knows what it's, you know, five years. I mean, yeah, go and watch those two interviews with Emad. They're what, like, Rao, like six months apart? They sound like they're 20 years apart, the amount of progress he's talking about. In, three in, in, between, apart. It, right, three, three months apart. Right, three months apart. The amount of progress he's talking about between those two interviews is absolutely insane. And, yeah, look, I mean, to go back to, your, to, to where you picked up from me, no, certainly it's not going to be... It's not going to be all roses at all. I mean, this, this is going to amplify humanity in incredible ways. And the long term sort of big picture prospects can be amazing. But for hundreds of millions of individuals, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult and disruptive in ways that are very hard to understand. I mean, yeah, you know, we've, we've all been reading about 10,000 people laid off from Meta this week. That's that 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 is not the big job story of, of this week. As, and I know plenty of them as sad, as sad as that is, you know, that is not the big job story of this week. The big job story of this week is that one point two billion people are about to crash into these tools. A hundred thousand juniors at, at Accenture who make the PowerPoints are about to realize that you can do that in 10 seconds instead of a day now. Um, deeply, deeply disruptive for jobs. And we're going to have to redefine, I don't want to go too philosophical and conceptual here, we're going to have to redefine what work is, we're going to have to decouple, um, you know, uh, income economic reward from what we at the moment mm -hmm. call work, or we're heading to social catastrophe. But like I say, our governments are still trying to figure out Instagram. So... I'm this not is, optimistic. Yeah, about this is um, this is th there are there are people who have been thinking about the future of work for a long time and people just didn't listen and didn't take them seriously. They sort of could see that some version of this. They didn't know what it looked like was coming. Listen, we're, we're at the half hour before we carry on and take questions, because I know what we're all thinking as we sort of take a breath and try to process that is also how do you invest in it if it's possible or you know how do we need to think about this from an investing point lens um if you have not already hit the code come join us this, these are these are really 
as we said at the top, really important times. This is the kind of information that you need. It's frightening what we're talking about right now, but you need to be able to process it to understand where things are going. I certainly feel that way as a parent who's trying to think about college. Like this is, this is my whole world's turned upside down this morning when I listened to that interview. So come along with us, hit the QR code, uh, all the information's in the chat so we can continue the conversation. Um, we'd love to see you there. And if we don't, have a great weekend, have a great St. Patrick's Day. Um, and definitely you might need a drink after this conversation.